This video is about the 6O's electrical system negative or grounding pathway. This is the baseline work and may be as much as many people need to do. It's detailed, but I think that it is important to cover before moving on from here. And if the details are too much, at the 15 minute mark is the Cliff Notes version. I think of electrical movement described as electron flow, electrons moving from the negative to the positive post. Conventional flow is described as a charge moving from the positive to the negative. In my experience, thinking only in conventional flow terms often misses important points, and usually maintenance is overlooked as well as design considerations. What had bothered me for some time were the voltage readings many of us see on system monitors. Direct readings off the battery were always higher and more consistent. Many of us have gone the route of purchasing upgraded alternators and cables to provide more electrical power, so getting that power well distributed is important to us. My previous video was about improving the cables from the driver's battery, balancing the current flow for improved battery life. Those cable additions were not intended to have a major effect on anything other than battery use and starting, although during that process, the cleaning of any connection certainly would help the overall system voltage, especially if those connections were corroded. For me, I found a surprising interaction between all the cables and wires during low plug warm-up, starting, and engine running. Even if you have a stock electrical system, you can improve the negative or ground cable connections for better flow. Ford uses two components as ground planes. When we look at Ford schematics for the electrical system, there are two connections to the frame to link the two batteries together. The frame is also used as the negative pathway for lights and trailer connections at the rear of the truck. These connection points down on the frame become less than ideal over time and should be cleaned to lessen voltage drop. And with the 6.0, we have one major connection of the negative cables to the block. This is unlike the 7.3 liter that has a cable from each battery directly to the block. The second ground plane for all other electrical components is the welded assembly of the body tub, and all component harness negative connections are made to the tub by means of fasteners. These connections are located in the engine bay and cabin at many locations. Each location is a potential for a poor connection, resulting in a voltage drop for its component. And there is one noted negative or ground connection to the body tub from the supply of the batteries and the alternator. And that's located here, from the passenger battery negative terminal to the inner fender, utilizing an 8 gauge cable. Again, throughout all the pages in the wiring diagrams, this is the only connection from the battery's negative terminal to the body tub. And by means of the battery negative cables to the motor, this is the pathway for the alternator negative side. But then we have these two other cables. The braided engine block to firewall cable, which is 26 inches long. The braided frame to body cable under the passenger footwell, which is 8 inches long. Ford uses braided cables for bonding to keep all metal components at the same electrical value. Bonding prevents electrical differences between panels that can interfere with radio and electronic equipment. In fact, when you look at the Ford packaging, these cables are labeled as bonding cables. In Ford diagrams, they are not identified at all. They are not listed in the current path. But as conductors, it's impossible for them not to be, and will do so based on their resistance. In the next video, you'll see how these three cables, the two bonded cables and the 8 gauge negative lead will act in parallel. There are no gauge listings by Ford for the braided cable, but I found a supplier who lists braided cable dimensions and relative cable sizes. The two Ford braided cables are each 12 gauge. So for this project I'm trying to get the best electrical flow, especially the FICM and PCM. To do that I need to know where the harness grounding points are. Sometimes it was thought the cable terminating from the FICM harness to the local intake stud was a negative or ground path. A number of FTE members pointed out this is a shielding ground, not a component ground or negative pathway. 
Ford's electrical diagrams for my truck show G100 and G101 as harness grounding points. They are the first two grounding points by name. With later model vehicles, rather than the power steering reservoir, the ABS controller is in this location. It's hard to find a schematic of powertrain components that doesn't show these two locations. Page 26.3 shows G100 with a wire for the PCM power relay and PCM. G101 has a wire from the PCM and another for the mass airflow sensor. Page 26.4 shows G100 with all the horizontal fuel conditioning module component grounds. Page 26.5 shows G101, the only grounding point for the thickum with a 10 gauge wire. G100 is also the grounding point for all transmission solenoids. These are two really important negative pathways and supply all powertrain functions. Ford does not remove the paint of the sheet metal connections during assembly. This is an example of my truck's condition where the FICM and PCM terminals connect after 12 years. You'll notice on the terminal for the harness grounds, they are formed like an internal tooth washer. It's easy to assume their purpose is to prevent the fastener from loosening. But the first terminal at this location has an anti-rotation lug that fits into a punched hole. So that maybe with the singular terminals or with the overlaying terminal, the feature prevents the fastener from becoming loose. But while the fastener on the left is the typical 6mm flange screw Ford uses, all the grounding fasteners incorporate a captured but rotating flat washer. So the teeth of the terminal can't prevent the fastener from rotating. They would grip the rotating washer. The other characteristic of the grounding fasteners is they are self-threading. In doing so, on the assembly line, the nuts threads are formed to achieve full contact. This provides an improved electrical flow path and minimizes any opportunity for rust progression. So it's unlike using a standard hardware fastener with clearance in the threads. It has full contact. This unbolted terminal shows the teeth have returned to a twisted state, so the metal has some spring to it. I've highlighted the edges that stand proud. Since I'm going all whacked out on details, let's take a closer look at the terminals. The one side had the teeth punch proud of the rest of the terminal surface. But the side facing the washer of the fastener is flat, with the teeth punched through. So they are trying to provide the best contact area towards the washer. The washer is not as large as the terminal is. And these terminals are larger than any store-bought terminal. So they have a larger mass, just like a larger wire, and would flow more current. The other interesting design feature of flat on one side, teeth on the other, is they nest together very well in a stack. But with Ford you'll find no more than two terminals stacked together. Otherwise two wires are entered into one terminal. And on the early models of our truck, heat shrink was used to protect these crimps from environmental exposure. This is typical of many training illustrations for electronics grounding connections. The lower tooth washer is identified as a spike washer, which can improve contact between the terminal and base, but also can provide resilience for thermal expansion and contraction, which I believe is what Ford is doing rather than a Belleville washer. In this illustration, the panel is stripped of paint. It's also covered with grease for corrosion protection. Obviously, with Ford's terminal design, we can forget about the concept of a lock washer. If we take a close look at the painted surface under these terminals, we can see what looks like breakthrough of the paint. But the contact is so small, I can't conceive this is an intended electrical pathway, even with the fastener's clamping force. And to document what that clamping force is, all of the harness grounding points is a 6mm fastener torqued to 89 pound inch, which is over 1900 pounds of clamping force. So it looks like the pathway for the electrons is from the panel to the welded nut, then through the threads, through the head of the bolt, and to the washer, then finally to the terminal before going to the wire. The paint acts as an insulator, but it's a functioning system. 
So let's take one of these terminals and bolt it down to a flat plate with a 6mm fastener at torque. And it looks like those raised teeth are compressed and you'll have good contact with the sheet metal. So the only thing in the way here of better electron flow is paint. So with a tool like this Dremel and a wire brush tip, it's real easy to get that paint out of the way. Maybe a good thing? And eh, maybe not. Back around 2010, when I was young and stupid, I removed the paint under the 8 gauge negative battery terminal at the fender, as well as the ground next to it for the vacuum pump. It was a common practice at that time to clean the surfaces, bolt everything back up, and then cover it in, in grease. After a few years, that didn't work out too well in New Jersey. Like many northern states, the black macadam roads turned white with the icer in the winter. Along with the rust on the panel was iron oxide transfer to the terminal. Again, the only points of contact were the tips. And the bolt rusted too. This needs to be protected better than what I did back then. You could leave it alone and follow Ford's methodology, which you can refresh by just loosening and then retightening the grounding fasteners at the body tub locations. And if you ever wondered about your truck's birthday, this truck was built May 31st during the second shift. Let's go back and take a close look at the surface that rusted. There are a few contact points, probably the high pressure points under the 1900 pounds clamping force, where rust didn't migrate under. Yet. Yeah. Notice the threads are rust free. So again, I don't think Ford uses the sheet metal surface for a conductive path and we have the potential for causing more issues, unless we provide the clean metal surface with rust protection. Going back to 2014 when I discovered this issue, I did go ahead and re those connection points. Dielectric grease and other products do provide rust protection where they directly contact. For my single point connections, I've been trying the conductive grease, no oxid, but it's not the only product. Some say silicone dielectric grease is just as good. And there are other products that could be used that are available for electrical connections. Some have used anti-seize grease that contains metal. There's been a lot of discussion if there really is any difference between any of these or if they work at all. Some feel the grease never gets squeezed out from under the connections. Again, these fasteners generate over 1,900 pounds of compression. If no oxid is really conductive, it shouldn't be used on multi-point connections if you try it. And checking those locations years later, it looks like this with the grease, free of rust. The wire terminal didn't have the iron oxide transfer, and the fastener didn't oxidize. So for me, using that method worked okay, since I previously altered the sheet metal and terminal surface. But everyone needs to choose his or her own path. I may have improved the contact to the ground plane slightly, improving those connection points of the terminal, but that may be more of a wish than fact based on those previous images of contact. A less aggressive way of dealing with the body tub terminals would be to disassemble the connection, spray clean with deoxid or electrical contact cleaner, braid the terminal and bolt with wire brush or scotch bright, and then reassemble with grease. So we have options. With the battery high current negative connections to the frame, there are none of those features, most likely because they need a large contact area on both sides for the high current load. And as you can see, these should be cleaned and protected maybe every five to 10 years, depending on your environment. The bolts are self-threading bolts for improved thread contact, but they have no captured washer. And the clamping force is higher. 2,747 pounds with 18 pound feet of torque. The cable connections to the frame usually have the worst corrosion due to the lower environmental exposure, and they are difficult to get to. The service manual instructions say from under the splash shields, but for me, to get good access, I remove the air cleaner, batteries, battery trays, and CAG tubes. And maybe the most important connection of all, the singular battery negative cable connection to the block. 
which clamps at over 4,400 pounds with a 35 pound-feet of torque shown in the original 2003 service manual. That's not the only negative pathway to the block. You remember the braided cables. After I got my truck back from having a new motor installed in 2010, while crawling under the truck to do an oil change, I noticed this bonding cable in two pieces, corroded and burned. I replaced it with two 8 gauge wires and continued on figuring the corrosion got to it. At that time I could not understand why a bonding cable would burn up like a fusible link, unless when the motor was installed something was not installed right. When doing the work on the starter cables I came across this 2003 vehicle recall. So maybe the nut was not torqued down correctly. But they also increased the fastening torque and replaced the stud in this recall. And now with the new torque value there is almost 6,000 pounds clamping pressure. So if you find either of the two braided cables had become fusible links and you haven't cleaned or checked the main cable connection by the crank, it's a pretty good time to do so. So all the connections that were cleaned at that time on the negative supply side were all battery terminals. Driver's battery negative cable to frame with my installed link to the engine block. Passenger battery negative cable to engine block and its link to the frame. Passenger battery 8 gauge cable to fender. Engine block to firewall 12 gauge bonding cable. Frame to cab 12 gauge bonding cable. G100 central junction box with its minor PCM junction box relays, horizontal fuel conditioning module connections, and transmission control. G101 FICM negative terminal, mass airflow sensor, and PCM major connections. I also cleaned the PCM pin connections with deoxid during my efforts. All of this did show an improvement with more stable voltage readings. And for many it's probably as far as you need to go. But I wanted to see if I could do better. So I'm leaving this as part one. For those who want to go down the rabbit hole with me, there's another video coming on measuring the flows to better understand how this all works, which includes an additional cable. I hope this may help you. Thanks for watching.